having me back, and uh, it's good to be talking about the topic that uh, is very close to my heart, which is alcohol. And of course, it's close to my heart because of this piece of research uh, I was part of uh, a few years ago when we did the, the first systematic assessment of the harms of 20 different drugs in the UK. Uh, and you can see that alcohol comes out as the most harmful. This, is, this graph has become kind of iconic now. It's, uh, that paper has been cited over a thousand times. And uh, it's uh, been replicated, as I'll tell you, this afternoon in my final talk in other countries. And the reason alcohol is the most harmful drug in most places is because of the social harm. The size of the red bar is the scale of the social harm of alcohol, the blue bar being the harm to the user. So how can we reduce those harms? <coughs> well, the first thing is we've really got to uh, accept that alcohol is a problem. This is, I think, one of the most chilling pieces of recent data from the UK, and I imagine it's almost certainly true for Australia too. Alcohol now is the leading cause of death in men under the age of 50. And I'm pretty sure in a couple of years it'll be the leading cause of death in women under the age of 50 in the UK because the emancipation of women and the fact that they're cleverer than men and work harder and earn more money means that they're now drinking more than men. And it's, un it's almost certain that alcohol will then become the leading cause of death in women under 50. It's a massive public health problem. But we know what to do. We've known for a very long time that there is this powerful exponential relationship between the consumption of alcohol and the harms of alcohol. And uh, it's ex particularly extreme for men, but it also applies for women too. And that means it's actually very easy to reduce the harms, because all you've got to do is reduce consumption. And you can see here, if you reduce, if you half consumption of alcohol from 100 grams a day to 50 grams a day, you, redu you reduce the harms of alcohol in terms of the likelihood of an alcohol-related death by eightfold. And there aren't very many uh, interventions in medicine that can give you such an enormous gearing. And so it's pretty straightforward, really. We just need to reduce how much people drink. In fact, uh, just last year, a group of uh, European uh, researchers produced a, a report called Alice Rapp, in which we suggested that this should be the the approach to all drugs, reducing consumption. We've recommended getting rid of the construct of addiction, which polarizes people and often allows people to say, well, I'm not an addict, so I can drink what I like or take whatever drugs I like. Uh, and we want to replace that with a concept of heavy use over time, because it's heavy use of drugs which leads to harm, not whether you're addicted to them or not. And we know from certainly European studies like this one that the biggest burden of uh, the harms of alcohol are driven by individuals who drink very heavily or, or who are dependent. The two right-hand bars are, cover uh, most of the, the harms. So reducing use, reducing dependence is the way forward. So what do we do then? Well, the first thing is to optimize treatment. We have treatments, but they're very rarely used. And uh, the other things we can do, are, uh, I won't have time to talk about, but we can deal with things like pricing and education in the discussion. And alcohol has the largest treatment gap of any brain disorder. Here you can see the likelihood of the left-hand bar is the number of people with an alcohol dependence who get into treatment. And it's minuscule in comparison with other disorders. They're not very well treated. Uh, the, on the right hand, of course, is psychosis, which tends to project itself into the public consciousness. Uh, and most people with psychosis get treated, but the vast majority of people with alcohol use disorders do not get treated. And the reasons for that are complicated, but it's a mixture of professional indifference and political disdain and the stigma. And of course, this great traditional view of uh, doctors that uh, an alcoholic is someone that drinks more than their doctor and most doctors drink rather a lot. So one of the really important questions we face now is this question. 
Should we be trying to reduce consumption or should we be trying to look for abstinence? And again, the f one of the reasons I think the alcohol treatment field has not progressed as much as it should is because there's, there are two factions. There's the abstinence faction, which is vehemently opposed to the harm reduction faction. And uh, I quite expect, when I give talks like this, two or three people to come and abuse me afterwards for even considering that there might be alternatives uh, to treatment other than abstinence. But I'm pretty sure I'm right, and I'll explain why in a minute. Abstinence, of course, is a wonderful goal if you can sustain it. But if you fail, and we know the majority of people who attempt abstinence fail at least once, you can die. And here's a, someone who died as a result of treating her alcoholism with abstinence. Amy Winehouse, heroin addict, alcoholic, clean from both drugs for six weeks, met the criteria the British government set for recovery, job, job done, she's no longer an alcoholic, she's been dry for six weeks, and then she relapsed, drank a litre of vodka, and died. And of course, you can argue that she died because she was abstinent, because she'd lost tolerance. Uh, and we, this is well established, of course, for heroin abstinence. It's a hugely risky enterprise. Not, not something we should deny people, but something we should at least be aware of. And the same, to a lesser extent, is true. She's an example, an extreme example. But there is no question that abstinence isn't necessarily the solution to everyone's problem. So then how can we reduce use if we want to go down that route? Well, we can use a whole range of medicines. We've got abstinence-promoting medicines, such as disulfiram and ecamprosate, hardly used at all. We've got substitution therapies, which are even less used. Sodium oxabate has been a medicine in Italy for nearly 30 years. It's been available in, in Austria for 15 or more years. It's an acceptable way of helping people stop drinking, but it's not used anywhere else in the world. And we'll hear a bit more about that later, because sodium oxabate is the, a medical name for GHB. And as soon as you talk about GHB, people get hysterical. But when you talk about sodium oxabate being used in a controlled fashion, actually it can stop people drinking and reduce them dying from liver failure. And baclofen, of course, has become very popular. In France, there are 300,000 people using baclofen to treat their alcoholism. Uh, no real evidence it works, but it, it probably does because uh, it's probably reducing consumption. And then we have uh, drinking regulators, drugs which uh, help people control the way they deal with alcohol. If they were to, they do drink, as many people do, even when they're trying to be abstinent. And those are drugs like naltrexone and narmaphene. And again, these drugs are certainly not used enough. And the great thing about alcohol is that not, we, we have a whole range of different treatments, and we have treatments which work at different places in the cycle of relapse. We've got drugs which can control the uh, brain mechanisms which lead to craving, and we've got drugs which can control the brain mechanisms which lead to relapse and repeated use. And in fact, we do have evidence from one or two small studies that combinations of those are even better than one or other alone. So we can justifiably intervene with medicines to help people control their drinking or stay abstinent, but we don't. And that really is a, one of the great public health uh, shames, I think, in Western medicine. <laughs>